Date, 251 DD. Official journal entry of Azira Sinetra, first quill to the eighth scholar of Sados. Today was my final day in the small island town of Lastport, and I once again found myself haggling. Master Barros, my mentor, had retired to our ship, complaining that his long-dead wife was waiting for him, leaving me alone in a trinket shop with no supervision and a bag full of coin. Rare has such a wise man made such a massive mistake. I have frequented many trinket shops the world over, but none like the one in Lastport. It was filled with the strangest artifacts I had ever seen. They weren't just trinkets, they were mysteries. There was a metal man who ran on gears lying broken in the corner, a knife whose blade was so black it seemed to drink in the light from my candle, and a glass monkey with obsidian eyes that followed me as I made my way through the clutter. Rarely have I been so happy. Though I am a poor scholar, to be sure, I do find a deep, abiding joy rifling through the cast-offs of society. You never know what you'll find in the trash. And nowhere else in the world could you find trash like this. Nowhere but in Lastport, the lone settled island located in the shallowest waters of the endless ocean. These were trinkets from another world each one claiming origins past the horizon. After about an hour or so, my bag was nearly filled, and the shopkeeper was close to tears, having been tricked into several sales that he thought, at the time, were his idea. I had in my possession an amber telescope which saw great distances, but whose vision was obscured by an ominous red mist, that dark, thirsty knife, and a rubber ball that bounced extremely well. What can I say? The voyage back to the mainland is a long one, and Master Barros, though once a brilliant man, has deteriorated past the ability for stimulating conversation. The ball would provide an adequate substitute in the meantime. When my coin purse was empty, I begrudgingly prepared to leave, but stopped when something caught my eye. It was a large wooden chest with a broken brass lock. There were no markings upon it, nothing to garner any special interest from me, nothing but the wood. It was not especially fine wood, nor had it been polished or designed in any particular way. In fact, the only thing that separated this chest from the many others in the shop was that I could not place its origins. This was odd, as categorizing nature is one of my many duties as Barrows' second. I believed I knew every type of wood known. But this chest was not made of pine, oak, walnut, or cherry, nor agar, ivory, dalbergia, or bacote. No. This wood was new. Or at the very least, different. It was the grain. Instead of the straight lines we are accustomed to, they sparked out like lightning following no logic of nature that I knew of. They intersected and split apart seemingly at random, and in some places they even turned outward as if trying to escape from their wooden cage, bending the chest as they did. I traced the lines with my hand, mesmerized by their mystery. I asked what it was, and the shopkeeper shrugged. Salvage, he said. I asked what was inside, and again the shopkeeper shrugged. Books, he said, but not written in any language I know. I gave an involuntary squeal of excitement. Books, knowledge, and readable, not destroyed by water damage. And if this chest truly was salvage, that meant its origins could extend into the endless ocean itself. It could be an account of what lies in the waters beyond the small docks of last port. In a bit of cruel revenge, the shopkeeper capitalized on my excitement, swindling me out of both the telescope and the knife in my attempts to afford the chest. I did, however, manage to keep the bouncy ball. A small victory, but an important one, as I'm sure all can attest. Finally, after a haggling session I am still ashamed of, 
I had my servants load up the chest and return to the ship. Once safely below deck, I opened it. The chest resisted me, but using a crowbar as leverage, I proved the stronger. With a small exhalation of air, the top unsuctioned from the chest's body. The contents were dry, the chest miraculously sealed to the damaging hands of the ocean. My wonder at how a chest could be completely waterproof was drowned out by its contents. The thing was filled to the brim with books. They were old, to be sure. Perhaps a hundred years or so, their pages dry and delicate. I find the spines of books lying next to one another to be truly one of the most beautiful sights this world has to offer. They are like the many brush strokes of a tapestry, each one doing its part to create the whole. And these spines took my breath away, cracked and aged as they were, each one a different texture, a different color, filling my eyes with a rainbow of knowledge that would put to shame any jewels or gold. Each book was numbered using the Sedotian alphabet. But what truly fascinated me was the writing. It was an old Verites letter system that had died out in the great imperial purges nearly 80 years ago. The only reason I recognized it at all was that Master Barros, in his delirium, often scribbles notes to his wife in this dead language. I do love a puzzle. And Master Barros has taken the start of our voyage home poorly. He seems not to know where he is, nor who I am. Though this once disturbed me, I am now relieved. His dementia gives me freedom for the length of the voyage, a voyage of which I plan to spend every waking moment translating these fascinating texts. And with each word I read, the more my wonder grows. These books are diaries. They tell the tale of a ship called the Alabaster Queen, which set off some 100 years ago to explore the endless ocean. Though I cannot be sure until I check the records, it is safe to say that they never returned from their journey. No ship has ever returned from the endless ocean. But in some way they did return, for these books tell their story. And the more I read, the more I am convinced this chest, with its strange wood and strange words inside, is the first honest telling of the world that lies beyond Last Port. A world that has stubbornly remained a mystery to us scholars, no matter our efforts. A world of magic and danger that until this point has only existed in our imaginations. From what I can tell from the little I have translated, it seems it is a world even beyond that. If you are reading this, I invite you to come with me on this adventure, to the great southern ocean, so vast and dangerous that not even the sun dares venture into it. Come with me to explore the endless ocean. The Endless Ocean was written by Keenan Ellis and performed by Beth Seeley and produced by the Fool's Gallery Podcast Network. Check out our other podcast, The Phone Booth, which explores a world in which 99% of every human being on the planet has a superpower. Also, if you like our shows and want to help us make more, please consider becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash foolsgallery. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week on The Endless Ocean.